Scorched Earth by Jonathan Crary. Uh, this is the first part of chapter three. In our disintegrating society, the public sphere and the sphere of intimacy atrophy at the same time. That's a quote from Alexander Klug. As the internet complex expands and aggregates, more facets of our lives are funneled into the protocols of digital networks. The disaster is the irredeemable incompatibility of online operations with friendship, love, community, compassion, the free play of desire, or the sharing of doubt and pain. Many of these disappear or they become recomposed into depleted simulations, drained of their singularity and ineff ineffability, permeated with absence and shallowness. There's no joy or sorrow, no beauty or exuberance on the internet. One can find poems, but no poetry. How can we gauge the full consequences of so drastically confining the richness and limitlessness of human potentiality within, within the desolation and monotony of digital systems? The madness and violence of this dissonance, dissonance is evident everywhere, but at the same time obscured by the delusional belief in the inevitability that our lives must be lived online, where our hopes and creative energies are inexorably dissipated. In this sense, the internet complex is continuous with how capitalism has long demanded a channeling of human energies and emotions into patterns that are molded by economic and disciplinary requirements. Herbert Marcuse gave an influential account of this process. Underlying the societal organization of human existence are basic libidinal wants and needs, highly plastic and pliable, they are shaped and coordinated with the interests of domination and thereby become a stabilizing force which binds the majority to the ruling minority. Repression, he wrote, could become so effective that it took on the illusory form of freedom or independence, and one of his examples is the willing mass submission to the entertainments of the culture industry. Marcuse explained how the performance principle induced people to willingly perform pre-established kinds of labor or economically necessary functions instead of following their own desires or instincts. Central to his work was the contention that capitalism administers society through a fusion of technology and subjugation, of rationality and coercion. Technology provides the great rationalization for the unfreedom of human beings and demonstrates the technical impossibility of being autonomous, of determining one's own life. At the same time, he argued that capitalism's exploitation of nature was damaging to human capacities for the sensuousness essential to the imagination and creation of non-oppressive social environments. In the 1980s, postmodernists of various sorts dismissed Marcuse's work as old-fashioned. His understanding of power as repressive seemed heretical to all the newly minted Foucauldian ac academics. For others, he failed to recognize the playful and creative possibilities of technology. Then, after 1991, what did it all matter anyway, since capitalism was here to stay? Notwithstanding these critiques, Marcuse allows us to see some of the continuities of the internet complex with entrenched features of capitalism that have only intensified since the 1960s. More invasive forms of technical rationality have produced what Bernard Stiegler sees as an extreme phenomenon of proletarianization. By this, he means the ongoing colonization of consciousness, the homogenization of experience, and the anesthet anesthetization of the senses. Both worker and consumer are dispossessed of knowledge, of communicative abilities, of desire. In the mid-1930s, Edmund Husserl addressed the general outlines of the catastrophic predominance of technocratic values in modern European intellectual culture. In his unfinished text, The Crisis of European Sciences, he put aside the rigorous formalism of his earlier work to examine what he saw as a tragic divide between modern science and the life world. Then in his mid-70s, writing after the enactment of the Nuremberg race laws barred from teaching or publishing, Husserl's pessimism was compounded by his social isolation and deteriorating health. Nonetheless, the crisis is only indirectly about the, about the contemporary nightmare of Nazism. Rather, his concern is the evil and barbarity that result from one-sided rationalism, 
manifest in the mathematization of the world for objectives that betrayed a European dream of a reason guided by spirit. For him, the crisis was the transformation of natural science into mere technization. When mathematics becomes a mere art of achieving results through a calculating technique according to technical rules, it no longer is grounded in the purposiveness of the life world. Husserl provides numerous characterizations in ordinary language of what he means by Lebenswelt. It is the world as the universal horizon common to all humans of actually existing things, an openly endless horizon of human beings who are capable of meeting and then entering into actual contact with me and with one another. That is, the life world is never private. It is the ongoing life and work of community that occurs through what can be talked about with others. He insists that in our continuously flowing world, perceiving we are not isolated, but rather have within it contact with other human beings, even what is straightforwardly perceptual is communalized. For Husserl, perception is a dynamic and constitutive element of common and shared experience. The life world is ceaselessly recreated by the perceptual adjustments and attunements that ensue from the meeting of individuals in a communal milieu, a coming together marked by the rhythms of the day, of work and rest. Many others have also argued that the meeting, in Husserl's words, actual contact with others, is indispensable indispensable for the possibility of community and forms of democracy. Hannah Arendt championed the radicality of the workers' councils that first emerged during the French Revolution. These provisional expressions of self-government and egalitarian participation have appeared spontaneously during moments of crisis and upheaval, arising during the Paris Commune in Europe between 1905 and 1919, in the 1956 Hungarian uprising, and in other moments. She also extolled the format of the New England town meeting, lamenting that this failed to take hold as America expanded westward. The town meeting, quaint and outmoded as it may seem to some, is another manifestation of direct democracy based on face-to-face decision-making, where people openly pre- present who they are in a non-hierarchical format. It was understandably feared and obstructed by James Madison and the early American elites, Together, the town meeting and councils pose a vision of small-scale community governance based on participation rather than passivity, where choices affecting the group are not left to representatives or experts. Among economically disenfranchised peoples in Southern Europe, Latin America, and other regions, informal neighborhood and workplace assemblies have emerged intermittently as forces for social and political change outside of established frameworks. A compelling example is the, is the Zapatista movement in Mexico, which is grounded in indigenous political struggles on traditional forms of direct democracy. Best known is their commitment to the Encuentro, a community meeting, large or small, where debates of all kinds take place between equals. The format is privileged. because it nurtures enduring forms of group interdependence and strengthens a sense of responsibility for collective decisions. This has not precluded the use of of network technology for other kinds of communication, but these have been secondary to the shared exchanges of the Encuentro. Readers of Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle often pass over his admiration for workers' councils and his advocacy of the council form as a vital element of revolutionary struggles. In the concluding paragraph, he writes that the power of the councils was the realization of that active, direct communication which marks the end of all specialization, all hierarchy, and all separation. Debord was one of many for whom the encounter, rencontre, was essential for resisting the spectacle suspension of a common life world. The spectacle, he wrote, produces a systematic organization of a breakdown in the faculty of encounter and the replacement of that faculty by a social hallucination, an illusion of encounter. It's not difficult to see the internet complex as continuous with developments that were well underway in the 1960s. But today's social media perform an even, but today's social media perform an even more sweeping 
eradication of community. While forms of mediated communication have existed for millennia, it's only recently that telephonic and televisual apparatuses have become fully integrated extensions of the ways we communicate. Most of these developed in response to the needs of a growing global economy and a modernizing military. But until the mid 20th century, they remained supplemental to long standing patterns of direct meetings and encounters between human beings. As Debaud and others noted, spontaneous or unprogrammed forms of being together became irreconcilable with the rationalization of consumer society. This led to the suppression of uncontrolled political or popular assemblies and to the commodification of the urban spaces and temporalities of everyday life in which ordinary forms of personal interaction occurred. The techno-modernists have long disparaged any attachment to in-person interaction, insisting on its irrelevance amid all the new tools for communicating. Communicating is in quotation marks there. But the unspoken truth is that face-to-face -face encounters entail too much wasted time to be compatible with the speeds and financial efficiencies of online exchange. And no data can be extracted from them and instantly put to use. The value of a face-to-face -face encounter has nothing to do with some misplaced sense of its authenticity compared to telematics or other kinds of remote contact, which have their own authentic features. Rather, the direct encounter between human beings is something other than and incomparable with the exchange of transmission of words, images, or information. It is always suffused with, with non-linguistic and non-visual elements. Even when unexceptional or unmindful, the face-to-face -face meeting is an irreducible basis of the life world and its commonality. It is charged with the possible emergence of something unforeseen that has nothing to do with normative communication. An encounter does not occur in empty space, nor is it bounded by the frame of a screen. It is an immersion, an inhabiting of an atmospherics, affecting every sense, whether consciously or not. This kind of meeting, this proximity, is literally a conspiracy, a breathing together. Yet the stifling of our propensity for our encounters and their responsibilities unfolds on many levels. One of the forces exacerbating this debilitation is the pervasive use of biometric procedures and related techniques to reconfigure human behavior and responses into quantifiable information. There is little in the body and brain that is now subjected to extraordinary forms of monitoring and analysis, and an important goal of this data acquisition is to maximize and habitualize our use of network technology. During the last decade, biometrics have been debated and critiqued extensively, but mostly around questions of surveillance, consumer profiling, and digital policing. My concern in this chapter, however, is the fate of what makes possible and sustains an intersubjective life world, the voice, the face, and the gaze. Capitalism requires their appropriation and utilization as parts of the weakening of an individual's capacity for caring, empathy, or community. Biometrics furthers the comprehensive habituation of human beings to interfacing with machine systems. The reductiveness of its operations, especially when these target vision and speech, leads to a splintering of the interhuman basis of a shared social reality. Biometrics grew out of the need for information about ill-defined urban populations, especially in relation to the organization of labor and new forms of policing and control. Social modernization required that individuals be knowable, visible, and identifiable. The laboratory-based research known as psychophysics was based on the principle that any relevant information about a human subject was obtainable through external quantitative methods. Everything once associated with psychological interiority, such as mind or consciousness, was taken to have a measurable physiological basis. This was part of the origin of what historian Andreas Bernard calls the quantified self. By the 1880s, one area of research was the functioning of attentiveness. It became important to determine its capabilities and limits, to learn how many things someone could pay attention to simultaneously, and 
uh, what enhanced concentration or led to distraction. Initially, these studies examined the attentiveness of workers in assembly line production, and by the early 20th century, the effectiveness of advertising, teaching methods, or any labor that depended on alertness or vigilance. This furthered the growth of enterprises that would develop into the eye-tracking industries of the present. Cumbersome machines began to be used in the 1930s, but now miniaturization has allowed eye-tracking software to be embedded in almost any device or location. Because so much economic activity depends on the constant use of digital interfaces in schools, the workplace, the military, entertainment, and gaming, it's obvious why the eye is now a major site of data gathering. High-tech corporations model their ambitions around an attention economy in which financial success requires soliciting the greatest number of eyeballs. Just as time motion studies and scientific management techniques sought to make efficient the motions and work of the body during a key phase of industrial capitalism, now scrutiny of the eye serves the goal of managing an observer's vision and training the eye to be an accessory of information processing. Not until the late 19th century did eye movement become an object of sustained study. The French researcher Emile Javal is credited with the first account in the 1880s of what he famously termed the saccadic, saccadic movements of the human eye. The connotations of this French word suggest a jerky, halting, fits and starts movement, and it's in the context of industrial modernity that such a characterization became possible. For thousands of years, close observers of other people were aware of the vital motility of the eye. Yet in the rich and diverse accounts of the eye and vision by Aristotle, Alhazen, Roger Bacon, Alkindi, Leonardo, Kepler, and many others, the movement identified by Javal is of little or no interest. Even in the geometrical modeling of sight by Durer and Brunelleschi, there was never any incompatibility between the tremulousness of the eye and quantifiable conceptions of visual perception. But, but with the advent of environments saturated with many forms of repetitive and unfaltering machine motion, the natural activity of the eye, like other behaviors of the body, came to seem erratic or haphazard in comparison and in need of correlation or correction, sorry. However, it is through the restless, rapid movement of our eyes, 10 to 20 times per second, that we continually create our visual world. Because only a small central area of the retina registers with acute clarity, most of what our eye sees is indistinct and vague. By constantly shifting that delimited zone of clarity, we synthesize an illusory but coherent picture of an external reality that appears as present to us. Eye movement is the temporal encounter of a body with a world in a state of continual emergence, an encounter in which memory, perception, and other senses seamlessly cooperate. Our eyes skim the surfaces of the world around us, motivated by a welter of interests, expectations, anxieties, and desires. For the philosopher Henry Bergson, an observer could never be understood as a mathematical point in space. A human being, he insisted, was a living center of indetermination, a position from which the world was perpetually changing, open to action, choice, and the possibility of freedom. Whatever minimized this indeterminacy or rendered perception habitual was an inhibition of life. Bergson was followed by many others over the next century who sought to resist the standardization of perception and the regulation of attention required by the industrialization of labor and new visual technologies. Eye tracking is currently one part of this larger ongoing project of colonization. Many assume that eye tracking is an intrusive form of biometric surveillance that identifies and archives the details of what we look at. But spying on individuals and their personal proclivities is not one of its main objectives. A more important goal is the discovery of large-scale regular regularities among targeted demographics with the aim of financializing the harvested information. Eye tracking data is used to curtail some of the intrinsic incompat incompatibilities between human vision and the visual milieus we now inhabit, and it provides analytics needed by designers for steering sight into appropriately attentive behaviors. 
the accumulated knowledge about the motor activity of the eye, literally the rotation of the eyeballs, is processed and deployed to maximize the likelihood of a user attending to pre-designed points or sequences of visual attraction. Put another way, the more that is known about the typical patterns of eye movements, what a gaze is drawn to and what it avoids, the easier it is to contrive visual attractions that will successfully solicit or engage visual attention. Thus, the actual use of eye tracking devices is merely the means by which data is acquired and whether any individual user has ever been tracked is irrelevant. Our concern should be, should be that we are all increasingly inhabiting and interacting with online word, worlds fabricated to affect predetermined routinized visual responses. According to one of the leading global firms, eye tracking provides compelling objective data that reveals the human behavior behind the interaction with interfaces or products and uncovers optimization potential. In one sense, it resembles older projects of persuasion, inducing us to look at or purchase something while maintaining the illusion that we are choosing and acting autonomously. Eye tracking records many phenomena, but one of the most important is the pattern established between the movement of, movements of the eyeball and the intervals of relative immobility, which are called fixations. The erroneous assumption among designers of eye tracking software is that if the eye is directed at a particular location even for a very short time, then this constitutes attention. A parallel and equally flawed assumption is that there is a correlation between what one is looking at and what one is thinking. Thus, for the needs of digital marketing and other business sectors, the complexities of attentiveness are reduced to a physiological model of brief and disconnected intervals of motor fixation of the eyeball. Eye tracking analytics are especially important in the expansive industry of user experience design known as UXD. This rapidly expanding business sector is responsible for much of what we see online and for the narrow models of attention that are the basis for their design work. One company tells potential clients, we're looking to create emotional connections in our design of tax preparation and personal finance websites. If you create an experience that connects with the user on an emotional level, you've succeeded. IBM, like most big corporations, does all their UXD in-house. In their cognitive e-commerce division, the stated goal is to build deeper human engagement. By knowing what our customers want before they do, by understanding nuances of tone, sentiment, and environmental conditions, we can engage customers on a human level and deliver the right experience at the perfect moment to inspire lifelong advocacy. One UXD firm announces that they have fashioned magical and meaningful payment experiences for shopping websites. Most often the goal of UXD is to craft interfaces that are frictionless, effortless, smooth, but, but which produce dutiful and pliant consumers. Here, frictionless is a synonym for the absence of reflection, thought, or doubt. William James, in his Principles of Psychology, made a concise and provisional definition. Experience is what I agree to attend to. While UXD is the perversion of this maxim into experience is what we tell you to attend to. James deplored the reduction of attention to a mechanism divested of intentionality, and instead that it could and should have an ethical dimension established by the choices and self-aware priorities of the individual. For him, a common field of experience took shape through the willed attention attentiveness of a historically evolving community of individuals. John Dewey went further in his extended accounts of the importance of experience as heightened vitality, as a complete inter interpenetration of self and the world. Experience, he said, happens not merely in an environment, but because of it, through interaction with it. It was like breathing, a rhythm of intakings and outgivings. For Dewey, experience was fundamentally transactional. He rejected the notion that it was the subjective product of private consciousness. Rather, the ebb and flow of life occurred in social milieus where experience is the greatest of human goods, a sharing whereby meanings are enhanced, deepened, and solidified in the sense of, communi of communion. 
Dewey's failure here was his inability to see the incompatibility between his vivid evocation of the creative potential of social experience and the tedious functionalism of the institutions he believed indispensable to economic and scientific progress. Now, however, the possibility of a common life of direct experience has been replaced by a passive receptivity to streams of stimuli that are imposed on us non-consensually. Again, the result is not so much new forms of control, which are rarely as effective as purported, but the impairing of our ability or even desire to make perceptual discriminations in real living environments. Long disparaged by academic philosophers, experience is the most accessible frame for ordinary people to articulate how the current order inflicts unhappiness on them. Anxiety, indebtedness, ill health, loneliness, addiction, and worse. As William Blake understood, it is what experience becomes a hell it is when experience becomes a hell that one recognizes the necessity of radically transforming the conditions of work, life, and imagination. Eye tracking is an essential tool for UXD designers because it indicates what features in a display or controlled environment are most eye-catching. Usually this correlates to what is recorded as a user's first fixation. This is simultaneously cross-referenced with gaze time, blinks, scrolling and clicking patterns, and other layers of information. The priority is not just to direct a viewer to a particular visual object, but also to channel our visual engagement from one fixation to another. It's important that nothing be looked at for very long, which is why there is a sequencing of attractions that briefly hold the gaze point, but then lead elsewhere. Paradoxically, an eye-catching visual object is also one that is shallow and without complexity. It must have some features that are perceptually compelling, but quickly drained of interest. Equally important is how eye tracking, eye tracking identifies and helps in the elimination of anything deemed confusing. These would be design elements endowed with some degree of ambiguity, indistinctness, unintelligibility, or other quality that would frustrate an immediate or effortless perceptual grasp. Eye tracking would detect hesitancy, a kind of stammering of eye movement that, even relatively briefly, is unable to settle into a secure fixation. But such minor sources of visual uncertainty and vagueness are corrected or removed in order to optimize usability. However, ambiguity and indistinctness are fundamental for our ability to make visual discriminations of many kinds. It would take too long to name all the artists, poets, and thinkers on the subject of sight in the last 500 years, but Leonardo, Rembrandt, and Goethe, through Ruskin, Emerson, William James, and Mellorme, for whom indistinctness and obscurity are fundamental elements of visual experience, as they straddle the boundaries between vision, the flux of memory, and the creativity of reverie. Today, however, engaging imaginatively with perplexing visual information is incompatible with the efficient integration of the viewer into the duties and temporalities set by neoliberal institutions. Thus, the most disturbing consequences of eye tracking have less to do with surveillance and privacy than with the devaluation and routinization of vision. One of the broader goals of eye tracking is the training of an observer user into probable patterns of performativity. Anything that encourages prolonged attention or even partially contemplative states is unacceptable because of the indefinitely longer amount of time such a response might take up. At the same time, eye movement that is vacillating or aimless is behavior to be deterred or redirected. We often assume that internet surfing means the possibility of following random uncharted visual itinerary itineraries, but in most instances, this is only a pseudo wandering that is in fact tracing a predictable sequence of fixation points interspersed with habitual patterns of scrolling and clicking. Like the phrase to navigate a website, surfing connotes an open aquas aqu aqu milieu, but the reality is repetitive itineraries devoid of actual drift or waywardness. From the standpoint of the bored individual, hours spent in this way may seem to be a, a de desultory waste of time but it is time occupied in a contemporary mode of informal work that produces value 
as marketable information for corporate and institutional interests. The eye and mind is discouraged from being errant and the observer is prevented from getting lost or from evading requisite visual tasks. In one sense, eye tracking is part of the persistence of what William Blake, Blake called single vision, which he linked to the narrowness of a Newtonian understanding of physical reality and a Lockean model of sensation. One of his best known images depicts Newton using the two pointed arms of a compass to trace a geometrical diagram, staring fixedly at the confined space of what is encompassed by the instrument he holds. Newton sits blankered from the overwhelming sensory plurality of the world, tragically cut off from the visionary powers inherent in all human beings. For Blake, single vision was the merely mechanical activity of the eye, isolated from interplay with the other senses and the imagination. The separation of the senses, which Marx was also to describe, became an integral part of the industrialization of perception that took off in the latter 19th century. The filmmaker Stan Brackage, who was influenced by Blake's mythopoetic framework, saw a related construction of the senses and contemporary techniques for the management of vision well before the internet. Most people's eyes are caught in tricks imposed by some very greedy people, so they move along certain channels of prescribed light, and the way they get tricked is that they don't look at the qualities and varieties of light. They're only trained to use it as something bouncing off objects or papers or signs. Finally, even the objects cease to exist. Eye tracking in its actual workings as much as in its name parallels the relation between hunter and hunted. It's a technology of pursuit with the goal of capture as the phrase eye catching confirms. With each new generation of digital displays, there are fewer possibilities of the eye remaining fugitive or autonomous. Specific features reinforce the affinity of eye tracking with hunting as well. The beam of light projected by an LED onto the pupil and iris is a targeting of the eye's radial structure, a literal target composed of concentric circles. Along with many new firearms and other weapons, eye tracking targets the observer with infrared light, IR. The human eye cannot see infrared wavelengths and therefore the body does not respond protectively by shutting the eyelid or turning the head away as one would in reaction to intense white light or sunlight. It produces no aversion response and it does not cause the pupil to contract, which also facilitates the gathering of data. Not only is it light that is not seen, but it produces heat that is not felt. Infrared light raises the internal temperature of the eye, actually baking it and, in, and injuring the tissue. Medical studies indicate that IR exposure can lead to cataracts, corneal ulcers, and retinal burns. Not coincidentally, this aspect of eye tracking corresponds to features of so-called directed energy uh, weapons, which deploy selected wavelengths of the spectrum to harm, to harm or destroy. Evolution over tens of thousands of centuries has shaped the eye's sensitivity to the energy of natural light. The anatomy of the eye was formed to collect and focus light of certain wavelengths on the retina. For most of human history, visible light in all its various conceptualizations was the only known part of the spectrum. Pre-modern cultures, with few exceptions, were shaped by a primal awareness of light as a form of energy that inter interacts powerfully with matter, most evident in the dependency of plant life on the sun. Its apparent immateriality, yet luminous sensual immediacy, allowed it to play a decisive role in the cosmologies of almost every society. Light was understood to possess transformative powers that were consistently spiritual or regenerative. regenerative. But in the West, during the 19th century, visible light loses its ontological privilege and from a scientific standpoint ceases to have an independent identity as it becomes conceptualized and manipulated as an electromagnetic phenomenon. Many overlook the fateful consequences of the rapid discovery of what is generally accepted today as the electromagnetic spectrum from uh, from 1886 to 1914, there was a quickening accumulation of research developments 
that led to some of the foundations of the techno-political social world we inhabit more than a century later. A cursory outline of those years would include the work of Hertz, Radio Waves, uh, Röntgen, X-rays, uh, Becquerel and the Curries, Radioactivity, Villard and then Rutherford and Bohr, Gamma Rays. However, these discoveries and their irrevocable remaking of visibility did not occur for, uh, fortuitously or as part of some disinterested quest for greater scientific knowledge. This familiar constellation of names sustains the popular narrative of theoretical and practical breakthroughs made by individual geniuses. But the reality is of gifted individuals working within what Max Weber identified as state capitalist enterprises, that is, within the new institutional complexes specific to the nation states that competing or then competing for territorial and economic domination on a global scale. The annexation of the electromagnetic spectrum coincided with the professionalization and specialization of science and with the demands of militarism, economic growth, and imperial expansion for new forms of energy, communication, and destruction. Of course, one of the most important developments of that 1886 to 1914 period was the research on the radioactive properties of uranium. Through multiple pathways, these discoveries would culminate over two decades later with the discovery of nuclear fission and the making of an atomic bomb. Now in the 21st century, most of life takes place in a saturated field of non-visible radiant energy, including the wireless networks whose radio waves reshape more and more facets of personal and institutional life. Most importantly, these developments have led to the industries of social control and mass lethal violence based on the vulnerability of the body and its defenselessness against scanning, monitoring, targeting, and irradiation. This condition of exposedness robs human perception of the possibility of being an opening and defacing in, onto the world, and instead amplifies the status of the eye as a site of external intervention. Iris scanning is another technology often aligned in the same devices with eye tracking, it too uses invisible infrared light to produce a digital image of superior precision to images made with visible light. It is one of the many forms of biometric identification being marketed and deployed internationally. The human iris fulfills the standard requirements for, for a biometric marker. Universality, everyone has one. Permanence, it doesn't change over a lifetime. Uniqueness, every iris is different. And acceptability to being recorded. This use of the iris was actually first proposed by one of the originators of biometric procedures, the Parisian police official Alphonse Bertillon. And in, in an 1892 research paper, he noted the potential usefulness of the iris as a biomarker, even though he knew that contemporary image making techniques were inadequate for its implementation. It wasn't until the 1990s that iris scanning products became widely available, and as of 2016, more than a billion images have been made. Until the very recent past, the exterior of the eye with the iris, its most vivid feature, had cultural meaning as a defining element of human face-to-face -face encounters. For thousands of years, in many different cultures, the iris was the presence in the body of a flickering chromatic vivacity, akin to natural phenomena such as rainbows or flowers. However, unlike the fleeting occurrence of a rainbow or the transience of flowers, the iris persists in the body for a lifetime. A shared gaze always holds the promise of a glimpse of iridescence, whether between friends, lovers, or strangers. Neither opaque nor transparent, the iris and its elusive colors shimmer and in their gentle dazzlement, some mystery at the heart of the other is withheld. It is moreover the iris with its contract contractile muscles that constantly adjusts the size of the pupil to control the amount of light entering the eye. It has a rhythmic response to the illumination or darkening of the world. Amid the fluctuations of light, the appearance of the iris, it's a... I don't know how to pronounce this word. It's... Aqueous translucence modulates 
and resists chromatic stabilization. How often have we noticed of someone we know well that the color of their eye shifts in different light? A wonder of the iris is that, for an observer, it is never identical to itself. Its colors are not static and thus unpossessable. Hegel, in his lectures on art, remarked on the singular brilliance of the iris and declared that it could never be authentically depicted in art. However, some artists were not deterred from attempting to approximate the beauty of the iris. Art historian Henneke Grutenbauer has examined a short-lived trend in the late 18th and early 19th centuries of miniature paintings of a single eye. These framed, often bejeweled watercolors on ivory were exchanged between lovers and family members as private sentimental portraits, worn as pendants or brooches. They depict the full eye and eyebrow, but the chromatic rendering of the iris is key to their effectiveness. Uh, Grutenbauer uh, sees these artifacts as evidence of an alternate model of visuality in which the reciprocity of gazes is experienced with extraordinary closeness. It is what she calls an intimate vision in which contemplation of the other's eye opens onto both its cherished familiarity and its enig enigmatic beauty. The ecologist Paul Shepard noted the evolutionary importance of the human eye with its iris as an organ of communication in addition to its receptive functions. The colored iris set in a white background is one of the most compelling features of human physiognomy. Between people in the act of self-presentation, eyes give and receive information. He further observes that apes, dogs, and even some birds are attracted to the human eye and iris. More than any other single factor, eye communication transcends the profound barriers of communication between species.